But yeah, I don't think, I don't have the date of your Not as prevalent. 
Um, interestingly, look on the left side. So 10% of those who um, are on the autism spectrum disorder have been characterized as having savant syndrome. But when you get out of that autism spectrum disorder, only 1% of the population shows those characteristics. And what are they? That's when you have like kind of a um, beautiful mind mathematical calculations. They can start seeing different things at a real time, quickly. Um, exceptional memory. They have calendar memory, which they can record dates. If you think of Rain Man, um, that's one depiction that we've seen in Hollywood from a savant. Um, and then um, often artistic and musical capabilities. Okay. So of course, um, we hope that individuals with autism spectrum disorder, um, savant syndrome, receive treatment early and the treatment that they need so that they can grow and, and engage in things that they want to do as kids, adolescents, and that as they grow up, they can also be an active um, participant in the workforce. So let's, that's where we get here, okay? Um, so in terms of hiring individuals, now going back to a general piece, any disabilities for a little bit. Okay, if you think 17.9% of persons with a disability were employed, that's it. So out of that previous number, less than 20% of those individuals are employed. Okay, for West Virginia, that's a pretty big issue. We have one of the highest rates of disability and one of the lowest rates of employment of those individuals. So for us, we're getting hit two different ways. Um, those that do get jobs, only 34 or 34 percent of them report that they have a part-time job. So if they are if they are getting a job, it's part-time. Whereas from the non-disability population, only 18 percent have to take a part-time job. And in this scenario for this um, episode, this series, we're talking about a health provider, in particular, a surgeon. Okay, so this is part of Hollywood, but you know, so we just go for the guest in, right? Um, but healthcare provider, generally, um, there's not a lot of research, but the research that's out suggests that less than 1%, I think it's like 0.52% of those in um, medicine, nursing, professional programs, social work was included, have a reported disability. Now many people not, may not report their disability, that's possible. Um, they may not seem relevant to the application process and the schooling process and that kind of thing, um, but that's the, the current statistics here. Okay. So the purpose of our event is to, to take a look at this, the good doctor. Um, I think they only showed the third uh, episode last night, maybe. So it's brand new. It's um, actually a... Um, been off of a South Korean show that they brought to the United States, which I thought was interesting. And um, here's the kinds of things that I want us to think about. So as we look at some clips, I want you to think about, you know, never mind the Hollywood spin of things, because their portrayal might be a little bit different, but is this an accurate portrayal of healthcare? And they might be in an OR, and not many of us have been in an OR, so we can't speak to that. But in general, kind of how we even think that our health providers would act, and how it might be, okay? So you're not gonna be judged on accuracy, <laughs> just your perceptions, okay? Is it, do you think it's an accurate portrayal of ASD, or savant syndrome? And then do you think that they included some balanced issues? Right, so if they talk about a challenge, do they talk about a benefit? Whatever that case might be. So you have um, a notepad in front of you. It might be good, we're gonna go through a series of clips pretty quickly. Um, it might be good that you wanna jot anything down of uh, something that seemed odd to you or was pretty relevant. Feel free to do that, okay? And then um, before we go into that, and logistics. You guys have already received kind of a login for Facebook. That's the twist for today. We have some people joining us on Facebook for this event. Um, they're liking. They're liking. So you can um, you can log in through your cell phone 
and provide a lot of likes and comments. We want to have the same kind of discussion, and Melina is going to be kind of monitoring that for us. So we want to see the same kind of discussions from people viewing this on Facebook um, as we're having here. Okay, so let me switch gears. So we're going to start with the first episode, okay, and I'm going to try to set them up. Thank goodness for clips, because there were certain aspects of the episode where I was like, oh, this is kind of weird, how are we going to get around? There's certain relationship issues, someone's already always in love in the hospital, that kind of thing. So, so the clips work out fine. Um, the first clip is kind of our first view of Dr. Sean Murphy. So again, Dr. Murphy, is actually a resident who's being hired to start work at a hospital. Okay, so they haven't seen him, um, and this is one of the first episodes where he's actually leaving his house and he's going to the airport and something happens. So we get to see an action. Um, and what do we do? What does he do? And I have to apologize for the clips because Wait, you're a little bit behind. Right. Why would you on a mission to the moon to retrieve the hair dryer you left the tracks in place? And that's just how you get them. Jargon. 
This sounds fantastic. <laughs> well, let's let's take a little closer look at get a closer look at Dr. Murphy and see. This next one is at the same time that um, Dr. Murphy is following this patient into the OR and making sure that he lives. Dr. Glassman, who hired him, is making a case to the hospital board to bring him on. They know that Dr. Murphy has ASD, and they're wondering what, why he brought him into the hospital. So do we know what year resident he is last five years? We don't. So, Unless they say later in the episode. Okay. But he's a resident. that those limitations are not what they think they are. That they do have a shot! We hire Sean and we make this hospital better for him. We hire Sean and we are better people for him. Someone tells me a joke, he doesn't get it. 
And here is an example hey. of when he's working with um, Paul. You're new to town, right? Yes. Well, I'm sure you have a lot of questions. No. You got to be curious about the place, about the people. Dr. Glassman gave me a map of the hospital, and I got a map of San Jose online. I do have one question. Yeah. Why were you rude to me when we first met, then nicer to me the second time we met, and now you want to be my friend? Which time was it that you were pretending? Mm -hmm. 
parents? Yeah. The little girl has a tummy ache because mommy and daddy won't stop fighting. This is a medical issue. Send them home. Could be intestinal malrotation, which could quickly become fatal. Every patient in this hospital could have malaria. But it doesn't mean we're going to go around testing for every condition we think they could have. For example, an MRI you ordered on the guy with the ear infection. Nice call, genius. Thank you. I was being sarcastic. It's home. He's healthy. Send him home too. Why are you smiling? Because you're right. He thought he was making a mistake. He didn't say anything. He just stood by watching, taking notes while he wasted everybody's time. Say your job. In my experience, doctors don't listen to nurses, and they only talk to us to lecture us when they can really screw something up. From now on, you won't run any tests you don't have them. How do I know if the test is needed until after I run it? She'll tell you. Today, she's your boss. Set that up is 
you're in our way. We don't want you in the OR. In fact, the one, the one uh, mentor says, I don't trust you in my OR. And so they want him outside of the OR and while well, they're in surgeries. And I don't know if that's... They're still in the intensive location hospital. There's still a, a fairly clear hierarchy where you have an intern level resident, a junior level resident, a senior level resident, and they're all, I mean, there's a very clear hierarchy. And so if he's just always answering the attending, that's, that's a little bit different than what we normally... So if we're kind of addressing the accurate portrayal of healthcare and systems, not so much that you would normally see, especially out of the first or second. I want you guys to think, keep in your head, and we're going to ask our panel members, too, just a little bit, you know, how did we get here? So we, we talked about, um, real briefly, you know, what is ASD, savant syndrome? But if someone's able to go through school, so let's think about why do we have less than 1%? That's our best statistic. In healthcare, in the healthcare field. So what are those hurdles? That they that might be faced, and then also, you know, let's talk about why the hurdles are there. Okay, again, a balanced discussion um, to get into nursing, dentistry, pharmacy, medical school. Once you're able to succeed there, then then graduate medical education, and then for certain multiple years, multiple steps. Here, we're just talking about the hurdles that he's having to face. Once, once on site, but how did he even get here? And and why is the only one person getting here? Okay. Hey, one game at a time. Next question. Can you repeat everything you just said? My life's here below. Technical foul. Wrong sport. Wrong network. So you need a limited number, right? It's America's largest, most reliable 4G LTE network. They won't let you down in places like this. Even in a strike zone. It's the reason. Pretty sure it's a strike zone. Here it is. All right, see you on the court, sir. Heads up. When it really, really matters, you need the best network and the best unlimited. Plans now start at $40 per line for four lines. Hello, Mr. Hello, Tumor. 
The only thing you can be explaining is why you undersold the wrist. We're doing the surgery. Jerry, I'm meeting number two.
that would go, or that gets said a little bit about the rush of it. Would. But what do you think about just kind of maybe his this actor's characteristics, um, and then as a provider, your reaction as a parent? I would say no. If the nurse is sitting there saying, listen, the surgeon said you can't go, no, we'll wait until he gets out of surgery. That's a really good point. I mean, the team can't be back and forth in front. That's true. Well, especially if your doctor is acting strangely like he is. You know, we've been talking about his mannerisms and stuff. As a parent, you're like, I'm not going <laughs> to listen to him and put all my trust in him right now. He seems crazy. Well, let's, let's save that for a panel because you bring up something. Does, does the hospital disclose why they, you know, he's not crazy. Here's what the situation is. Or is it any of their business with this provider? <coughs> what, the, what the issues are with this provider? So you can see some of the big issues that might come up. Do we ask our providers if they're clinically depressed or something else? Or, you know, maybe if they're had of some sort, but this, this brings up a, a very different interaction. So just like the man who had the prejudice against him having um, autism whenever they were trying to hire him, um, if there are family members that are having you know, some doubts because of his diagnosis, I think seeing providers that have autism and, and have a wide variety of disabilities are going to um, break down some of those barriers and, and alleviate some of those prejudices just in society the more you get exposed. It's a really good comment. You know, when I was trying to find the statistics for how many health providers have reported disability, so four articles, um, all of them said the same thing, which is a health provider with a disability is needed because that person will understand and empathize with the issues. So we need more of these people, but we have this amount. So exactly kind of what you're saying in terms of, let's see what it's like. Do you think we're walking around with some stereotype, or not so stereotype? We, we saw the list of characteristics. Um, we walk around with a certain set of ideals. And are those ideals something that we want in our health providers? I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. When you're in a situation, would you would you receive care from someone with a disability? Okay, of any type, of any type. That's where it hits the road. Where it hits the road. Okay, so that's that's it with our clips. And I saw our bandage came in. I'll ask our panel members to come down been involved in the discussion. Um, so let me introduce them. We have the chairs. <laughs> the lovely chairs. So let me introduce them. So Dr. Meredith Mandich is Vice Dean of Professional and Undergraduate Programs, and Associate Dean of Professional Programs and Chair of Physical Therapy. Um, Dr. Colin John is an Associate Professor in Medicine and Pediatrics. And then Dr. Constance Weiner is Assistant Professor in the School of Dentistry, Department of Practice, and Rural Health. So we have, um, we might have Dr. David Rosen, who's an anesthesiologist, but he's in surgery with a baby at the moment, so he may or may not be here. And then we had nursing present, but then she got pulled away as well. So trying to get a well-rounded look at our health sciences here. So thank you all for coming. We appreciate that. Um, so let's go back with kind of that original question of that we talked about earlier. And, and we see him as a, as a doctor now. What was that pathway probably like? Or have you seen, let's take a step back, our own experiences here. Do you think, what's our WBU experience with individuals with disabilities in any of our health science areas, going through schooling or working there? In general, do we have? I would say it's probably pretty decent. Having gone through medical school and then gone through residency, I can recall several providers, one notably, that uh, will kind of almost be that kind of that stereotypical disability that we kind of talked about at the beginning, who, you know, obviously made it through and um, is 
doing very well for itself as far as I understand. So I think, at least in my personal experience, it's, it's, it's been relatively okay. okay. I think there are um, barriers. So the Americans with Disabilities Act allows you to set forth for any job um, the essential functions. As I with those. So um, for all of our admissions programs, we set forth the um, essential functions. And those can sometimes um, provide a barrier, and they can be um, subject for debate. So for example, my core discipline of physical therapy, which does the rehabilitation for individuals with spinal cord injury and reintegrates them back to the community, one of our essential functions is that you have the ability to um, gate train people, to protect people who are falling, et cetera. And so that would preclude, theoretically, someone in a wheelchair um, meeting the requirements, which is, again, sort of distasteful because the profession you know, itself is dedicated to allowing people like that to access participation in society. So I think it is, um, for the person with a disability, they really have to be um, better. I mean, they shouldn't, you know, it's just not, shouldn't be true, but I think it is true. They have to exceed the expectations, and in addition to that, they have to have an advocacy both for themselves or for their family behind them. It's quite unique to make it in and make it through. Now, we have had several individuals with hearing impairments with cochlear implants, and they've been able to make it through with relatively minor accommodations. We have had uh, one person in occupational therapy who's in a wheelchair. Um, and she's practicing in hand therapy, so she has that um, scope of practice that doesn't demand that she be able to do her transfers and things like that. But I, I think it's difficult, and I think the building is still difficult. I get upset with the building um, in terms of accessibility. Um, we have difficulty with um, restrooms. We have difficulty with fires. Um, evacuation rats when we had a person in a wheelchair. So I think there are still um, um, challenges in person who is successful as a fighter. I agree about the essential uh, duties that have to be performed. Um, so we have those, those are limitations. Um, the more physical, so someone that would have uh, maneuverability kind of issues would be kind of our, our um, program a little bit difficult, uh, but we do make accommodations for uh, the Asperger's or the autism. Um, so we would we do accommodate uh, testing so that there's maybe a little longer period of time if somebody is dyslexic or has problems uh, in those areas. Um, but there are core issues that do have to be um, met in our curriculum. We, we don't really accommodate very well. Well, vision is another big one. Right. I don't know exactly. any of the health professions that someone with a visual impairment could very easily perform the essential functions. Um, and I was talking to someone before, well, Scott, Scott before about MCAT, and, and MCAT said they had made accommodations for the past 10 years or something like that. So even just the test to get in. And, and even with our admissions procedures, we have uh, multiple layers, uh, you know, the, the paper admissions and then the interviews, and several people look at our applicants. So we try to be as accommodating as possible and look at people, but there are just so many applicants, so it's difficult to make a choice anyway and then to uh, consider other factors as well. I can say from our residency program, sometimes you know, we, we might get a very small snapshot of things, so we don't get to necessarily scrutinize, you know, things that much to provide accommodations, uh, have them ready to go when they get there, so that can be a little bit challenging as well. The, the other we issue, want, we do want to have people with it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like it's precluding. Right, it's, it's just, just sometimes we just, we don't yeah. know, we don't have 
time, or we, we have no idea because they didn't put it down, or for fear of, you know, are we going to look badly upon this? I mean, you know, you have a, a potential physician that may have this particular disorder, which you kind of mentioned in the slides, they may not put down because it, I don't think it's relevant. Yeah. And uh, then that we don't know and it makes it difficult sometimes. And, and that was the second, it's a good segue. I think the, the is, is that 1% underreported? And, and the statistic was 1% of health providers have reported this, uh, disability. Well, I think it clearly is. I mean, if you look at medical licensing, I mean, a couple of the questions, like if you read the licensing very carefully, specifically, even in West Virginia, but I'm fairly certain it's similar other words. I mean, one of the questions is, do you have a condition that would limit your ability to, to practice medicine? I mean, if you certainly, yes. I, I don't know what happens, but I mean, I'm assuming it's, you know, a lot more scrutiny. Um, and, you know, whether or not you have to go in front of the licensing board and kind of explain it, I, I don't know, but it just may add kind of unwanted uh, more steps. And, and you're not really obligated, are you? Are you obligated? You really you are. I mean, you really are obligated to say it. I mean, to be licensed and take care of patients, do you have to you know, need that full disclosure, but I can understand the, the reluctance for folks not to necessarily disclose everything. Well, we get a, what is a disability and who, in, in whose eyes is the disability. I mean, you can do a marathon in a wheelchair if are you then disabled. So if you are in a wheelchair, would you necessarily feel like you had to disclose a disability? I don't know. If you had, well, let's take another much more common one, anxiety or depression, I mean, that would I think they probably know what discloses. Well, and we have a big issue now with our residents, right? Depression and big suicidal issue. ideation. So, good point. I think um, not only in health professions, but in general, I mean, the lecture I just finished was on cerebral palsy, and um, you know, there's nothing inherent in that diagnosis that confers a cognitive impairment, although sometimes it's a comorbidity. Um, but that population, the statistics in terms of their ability to be employed, to live independently, et cetera, are really appalling despite the efforts we've made with IDEA and subsequently ADA. It just wears them down, I think, in terms of um, the fight, and after a while, they'll just go take their SSI and disability income, um, which is really, really a shame. So, how do we? Um, there was one scene in there where uh, his one of the head mentors was making an argument for his hiring. And, and he was talking about the two sides of the coin here that you mentioned, which is, I think we all tend to look at it as a disability, but he's very able to let's look at it from that perspective. I think it's um, very common, I guess I'm speaking from my perception, it's very common to slide into that disability piece, very, especially when you don't have a lot of exposure to it, to see otherwise. What are things that we could do within the health provider arena in general, as in a particular teaching, um, to change that? You know one really good thing, I can remember it as a medical student, and I don't know if we do this much anymore, but during our rotations, um, in the mid-block, uh, so about four weeks in, we would actually do these, um, they call them like workshops. And I can remember at least one addressing the disabled patient. And, and I can remember having done that, and, and I'm gonna kind of go off on a personal tangent here, where we, we talked about how to work with hearing impaired folks, how to work with physically handicapped folks. And I can remember um, that I was on family medicine and, and, a, and a hearing impaired patient had actually come in like a week later, and I actually, you know, tried to use everything I learned, and I talked to her, and she she looked at me and um, had signed to her interpreter that I was one of the first people to actually ever address her, and so I think 
you know, doing things like that when uh, at the apt time. So really looking at dealing with patients while you're while you're dealing with the patients in, in the third and fourth year. I, I think that that gave me a lot of knowledge that I still really you know carry forward and teach my new residents. Yeah, they still have a mid lot, the not your standard. I don't, know, I don't know what they're like just because I'm not as involved with those, but I, I think those were really good opportunities and, and the timing is good uh, to do this. Any other ideas for um, exposing or just raising these issues? Keeping us balanced? I mean, we, we have the speakers come in as you, you do with in, in our class and a lot of classes in demo and dentistry, but in, in helping uh, with patients. We have patients that are willing to come in and talk about their disabilities and special needs, but as far as uh, having people who are in the healthcare profession, we don't have <coughs> to do examples to bring in. So that was the dentistry, I'm going to keep on dentistry for a little bit. Just because you have to keep the, the clinics People come in from the communities, and then you have the rural. Uh, well, that's the case for camps, actually. But the you have the rural that's sort of going on rural rotations and things of that sort. Is, are those places where they get more exposure to individuals with disabilities of a variety of types, or even those that you're kind of speaking to Doug Van, just statement of the building's difficult to get into. So because of that, we don't have a lot of people come into dentist dental clinic. With disabilities, I mean, do you see that? No, we don't see that. Okay, no, so they don't. Get unfortunately, that. a lot of we get a lot of referrals from outside because people are um, they're prepared to work with people with disabilities, but often find it uh, challenging, and so the referrals are made here. So that's good. I mean, our students then. And our students get the Um, what about, just in general, okay, so let's switch about ABC's efforts to shine a light on this topic. What do you think about that? Is that just a way to get money? Is that a good thing? Is it, could be good, could be bad? I mean, what are your, just seeing a few clips, so um, based on that, what do you think? And anything like that, I mean, we mentioned Rain Man. We mentioned other times where Hollywood is trying to. Actually, one of the best ones right now is Speechless. And so that really shows an individual using our main communication and the mother's um, argument with the school system to advocate again. I think any time you present in media, individuals with disabilities living or struggling to live and participate in normal life roles. I think it's insightful for the public at large, and I think it makes them think about things in a way they didn't before. There was one a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, that individual with Down syndrome, high functioning, um, and an individual actor with Down syndrome actually played the part. Um, so I think any time you enlighten the public to the possibilities, um, I think it's good. And I think for this especially, because he's obviously a very high-functioning autistic patient, so probably you know less on the spectrum. And so I think it kind of reinforces that fact that you know not all autistic kids are the same. Um, you know, we all have our stereotypes of what autism really is. You know, the kids that just kind of you know do their repetitive things and, and don't want to talk to anybody and have significant communication issues, but that is truly a spectrum. And I think that this at least, you know, other than the Hollywood portion, really kind of speaks to that. Would the same kind of behaviors um, that we saw here in the medicine side work in dentistry, like if he was a dentist or an oral surgeon? We've been working with the, the students a lot with interprofessional education and trying to get that um, people working together as a team attitude. And so he is, didn't portray a very good team player. And so he would probably need a lot of uh, work along those lines to try to 
learn some social cues and be able to read people better. Um, so I think that would be one of the challenges that you would have in, in dentistry. But, but, and I'll kind of jump on that. I'll say, I can say the same thing for a lot of new residents that, that, that a lot of, that's probably, you know, one of the hardest things to really learn, it, it, I think, is just because you really can't, it's hard to teach it. Um, and so I think, you know, having, you know, supervised plenty of residents, I think that that's something that might even apply beyond just this particular I know lots of residents that have a lot of issues with being part of the team. Um, so, I mean, obviously that is an issue with him, but I don't think it's unique. Or even a senior. Yeah. Oh, yeah. the team sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. So professionalism is big, and, and that might fall into the same pot. Um, some of the things you know, there was no intent to be professional. We mentioned about the family. Um, would his um, survey be high? His provider survey? What is it? Yeah. Oh, his uh, press gaining score. Press gaining score. <laughs> would that score have been high? It would depend. Um, um, and so, you know, I'll say this: that imagine. So he cuts the score open and he saves her life. Um, I think that potentially shines a whole new light on things. Versus, I mean. If he, if he cuts her open and there's nothing there, um, then obviously it, it's going to be an extreme, I, I really think. It. And in my experience, um, it, it can go either way. Some families really, most families would value bedside manner um, over clinical skill per se. Um, and I guess it's really family dependent. I mean, I've seen it go both ways. I've seen some families just, you know, they'll say, you know, I really hate that surgeon. He just, he comes in and he's just a real bubble. But he's an awesome surgeon, and I would refer everybody to them. Or, you know, the other families that say, I just, I don't want anything to do with this surgeon. So it, it, it really depends, and that's on a spectrum. Is it the same hold true to any other kind of provider? So surgery is high risk high benefit potentially, um, what about pediatrician or OTPT or dentist in terms of, um, do you have that same kind of leeway if you, if you fix a, a tooth that's hurting or acceptable or if you, I mean, how does that change if it does well, change for something like Yeah, I, 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 I think that's fair, you know, as, as a pediatrician, if I go in and just, you know, solve a problem but I'm really, you know, mean about it. Game score for sure, um, but and it all and it all, ha it all it's also the acuity of the condition too. If it's something like really really acute that is life threatening, I think that really ups the ante. Because surgery is not the only specialty where we see life threatening things, and so if I am, you know, and I know plenty of our medical doctors that um, may not necessarily be known for their bedside manner per se, but they're very adept clinicians and. Um, save lives, and so I think you know, depending on what your preference is, if you know, if you're okay with most people, it, it, again, it depends. You know, if you're, if you're okay with you know, lack of social skills and bedside manner, but you can save lives. You know, and we're a little bit different because we don't do anything to people. Particularly, um, we engage them sort of in a therapeutic encounter that hopefully helps them to feel better and progress towards meeting their goals. So I don't think that the situation would apply if you were an inadequate communicator um, that anyone would be grateful because the, the goals wouldn't be not like a surgery where you can do it no matter what, I'm going to assume some dental procedure. So I think we would be, the therapeutic encounter in the rehabilitation professions would be highly compromised if somebody couldn't um, behave abrasively or couldn't engage the person in, in the therapeutic encounter. And I agree, the surgical, I mean, sometimes expect some surgeons to be arrogant and, and you know, that, that's somewhat expected, 
but in the other fields, I think you would not be able to maintain practice in that way or style. So, you know, and I think also people who are um, into repetitive behaviors also have challenge, have um, appreciation for certain things like maybe radiology or something where it's, it's very repetitive looking at something very uh, routine. And so then maybe their specialties would be in areas where they're not really having a lot of patient contact. So I'm going to stop asking questions. Do you all have any questions for our panel or comments? We have some a diverse group of experts up here from different areas. Or in general, I know we have social work and psychology in the audience. How do you think? This would it would impact you know clinical practice, daily work in those fields. Well, almost really in, in, in psychology, it would be a little bit different having somebody who isn't able to express um, the. Uh, I, I feel like that's just different um, because that's like. Like, coming from, you know, doing therapy for years, it's like, kind of need to be able to express those kinds of emotions back and forth to one another to express understanding and so on and so forth. And I, I just feel like they're just so two very different fields that, like, in, in being a doctor, obviously I'd rather have a doctor that can save my life than be kind to me next to my, but you know, you know, <laughs> that's just how I feel, but at the same time, if I'm going to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, I'd want that doctor to be able to have that personable and that kind of communication and relationship with me to be able to make me feel open and willing to talk or however. Um, so I think they're two very different dynamics. <coughs> Do you think some people might, we, we used the term, you and I were using the term refreshing. Okay. Do you think in some aspects, maybe not consistently, <laughs> but if you went to a therapist, a psychologist, a social worker, and they had that, that, that could be refreshing in that sense or no, not so much? Um, that's, I, 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 again, I just feel like in that field, it's just, it's more, you know, there's so much relying on your ability to be empathetic and sympathetic and understanding and to express that. And if you have an inability to do those things, then it's really going to impact the, your effectiveness of your position. So, um, however, in this position, I don't necessarily feel like it would have the same kind of, of a negative impact on the um, effectiveness of treatment. So, you know, if he was able, you know, as long as his hands are steady and his mind is solid, then we're good. <laughs> you know, but it's just two very, so very different fields um, as far as like with that particular dynamic. So. Any other comments? Yeah, so while some people on the autism spectrum um, aren't very good with empathy, there are a lot of people that are. And I think having some of the social um, nuances aren't going to necessarily preclude a lot of people on the autism spectrum from being able to have a very good bedside manner with other people. So I don't know that necessarily that would be lumped in a, a stereotype for them, um, but because of the social deficits, maybe people would see it that way. That's an interesting um, point as to why we should probably be um, teaching um, person first because everyone comes from a strength-based approach. And so like Dr. Um, Weiner said, you know, maybe somebody would be choose a direction where their skills are really strong over something that would be communication-based if that's something that's not as strong. Or like Dr. Mandich said, you know, maybe instead of a PT or OT student um, having to be able to catch you if you're going to fall, focus on a hand um, as a specialty 
or you know, instead of being a pediatrician where you really have to be nice and get little kids to like you, um, then maybe, you know, being pathology or something like that. So I think that's why it's important for us to um, be more uh, cognizant of the person, not the disability, and make sure that um, each person's strengths are what we're looking for and not which box they're checking on the application because some people's um, deficits may also be their strengths and make them a really skilled um, applicant. Mm -hmm. So how do we make a system to do that? <laughs> right. I think that's an excellent way to kind of close us out, but then there, that is a challenge because we're all mentors. Someone, even if they just, even if we're not advisors, mentors, we set the curriculum for our students, undergraduate and graduate. People come, oh, you work at WVU. My child wants to do this. Who should they talk to? I mean, you get questions like that where, where we put that to the task, right? And do we do it adequately? Um, I mean, the fact that that, that statistic was so striking knowing that we know at least the pre-health, the undergraduate pieces have so many students in them and then where do they go? You know, it, it might be that they went to a, into a professional, you said that's a nice fit and that's excellent, that's the best scenario there, but did some of them take their third, fourth, whatever they could get? because of that or no one guided them. I mean, we all know how it, you know, if you know someone who's navigated it before, it's a lot easier. If you're navigating, applying to college, applying to graduate school, applying to med school, you know, the health sciences, it's harder than add on the disability where no one knows you really about the disability. And if somebody's reached that point where they've met all the criteria for a any program, they should not be denied access to that program just because of their disability. That's a lot of effort and every every other aspect that goes into a, a really solid application. And so it's really it's important that we uh, keep that in mind that they've, they've succeeded up to that point. So why wouldn't they continue to succeed? And maybe there's maybe there's barriers along the way that we can help out with. I mean, I, I was struck that like the MCAT hadn't given out, if that's true, accommodations for the past ten years. So that's a that's a significant barrier to someone who possibly could have, but if you have to take the MCAT to get to get that far with an application, if they can't, you know. So so I think uh, it's a it's a good place to close for us consider what little piece that we can provide and help in our navigations. Do we know all the services? Do we know um, what accommodations are available? Do we know the solutions for things when someone can't or asks for the, the easy pathway in the building? Um, things that are very simple, um, but we don't talk about, but maybe don't know on a regular basis. And then some things that are more complicated, like policy changes and really asking that question of out of 5,000 students interviewed, how many of those had a disability? Just out of curiosity. You know, just stuff like that. It sounds like our system is doing pretty well in terms of admissions when, when that comes in. So that's good to hear. Um, but we know that like our campus is not that high on the accessibility campus. Speaking to your point, so what kinds of things can we do to help with that? Um, things like that. So we have a charge. We have a charge for ourselves. Well, with that, um, any any other questions or comments from either our panelists or audience members? Any anyone from Facebook? I don't have any comments, but I would just like to say that thank you for those of you in the room. I know it seems like we're a really small group here, but we've had 120 views during this time. So this is the CED's first shot at a Facebook Live event. 
Um, and so I'm sure, and I know that there's going to be views afterwards. So even though it may have felt like you were talking to a small group, there was a much larger audience. So thanks for those of you that were here for engaging in the discussion. And so for comments, if people are putting comments, we can go back and see those and yeah. add to them or speak. Well, I thank you all for your time and expertise. We appreciate you sharing that with us very much. Um, and thank you all for coming.